Okay, welcome to second season of Success After Lockdown, man. We back, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Season yeah. two. Uh, yeah, success After Lockdown. Right. We're in the building. First, I'd like to take this time to thank our uh, followers from uh, our first season, man. We Absolutely. Grew, man. Absolutely. We Shout here. out to all those, man, that stood by us, that's supporting us, and that just believes in the movement and what we're doing, man. Absolutely. So, so today, we got a, a guest. That, uh, now, ain't no yes guess, yo. Ain't no yes guess, yo. Yeah, no question. <laughs> this family right here, you heard? This uh, this Exodus family right here, you heard? There it is, baby. Okay. Uh, you know and BX, I mean? baby. You know what I mean? Uh, so so we, we, go, we get ready to get right into it, man. We get ready to talk to the brother Rock Rilla, man. Rock Rilla in the building, baby. Yeah. Uh, we get ready to get into his business, man, and what he doing, man. Listen, for all you out there, you know, there's certain people you just meet and instantly just connect from the minute you meet them. Rock was one of those guys, man, that when I came over here and like the vibe was like we had knew each other forever. Absolutely. And like that, that energy right there and like, yo, much love, much respect, like real talk, like keep shining, keep doing what you're doing. You know, just a little background on Rock, man. Rock is a formerly incarcerated man who served some time, who is now doing some positive things in the community. Didn't just sit in the jail and talk about things that you're not going to do. You came home and you're doing it. The music, the, the motivational speaking, the giving back to the community, teaching the kids, coaching now. That's huh? Right. Yeah, right. yeah, got, That's absolutely. That's yeah, got a talk, coaching man. position. That's yes, right. This is the best part right here. Can you show me right again? Getting that coaching position a block away from where he grew up at. Sure. Yeah. Talk about success and going back into making a change in your community. So I want to, I want to go back, back in the time. Yeah. You know? oh. <laughs> that's what I want to do. Yeah. I want to go back right now, man. You know, let's start with telling us where you from, man. Who's Who's Rock Rilla, man? Yeah. Who's Rock Rilla? Yeah. Moms and dad, man. How How was it growing up as as you, man? Um, yeah, in order to get a story, you got to start from the beginning. Absolutely. So take it back a little bit. Um, I moved to uh, Washington Avenue in 166th Street when I was about five years old. That's in the South Bronx. And that's considered ghost town. Big up to the Bronx. Yeah, BXA. Yes. BX yes. ghost town. <laughs> <laughs> that is so, <laughs> yeah, that's ghost town, baby. And it's a block away from like 6 9 and Webb, which is, you know, another hot zone. And mm -hmm. so those two neighborhoods alone. Um, never had a dull moment. Um, my mom was a single mother of six. I'm the oldest, mm. right? So that had his um, excitement to it, mm. right? Uh, so I had six brothers and sisters that I looked after while she worked and went to school. She was also a practicing minister. She's a bishop now. She travels and preaches. Um, and my dad, uh, be honest, my dad was just as impacted. And he missed the first 15 years of my life because of it. And um, yeah, I went up for, for me and Slaughter. And you know, by the time he came home to be my dad, I needed Pampers for my son, you know what I mean? So it was like a weird time to try to sub in because it was like, uh, kind of past the, but you never, so it, it was probably because I was just a little bitter at the time, but now at 30, I still realize I do need my father every day. There's never a point where you outgrow him and it's like, I got it from here. Yeah. But he was just trying to make a relationship with me as a father and son and I was kind of, Outgrown that. that, yeah. Person. So, um, but yeah, like I said, uh, I was all uh, I lived in Ghost Town my entire life, um, up until my incarceration. But I was displaced, and now I'm residing in uh, Manhattan, where I help run this beautiful nonprofit and help all these kids in East Harlem. Absolutely, yes, yeah, yes. Man. Big so shout out, so big so shout out to that yeah, man. man. So Give him back, baby. Give him back. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, if we could like talk a little bit about, you know, um, just that upbringing and what led you to prison, and you know, what led you behind that wall, man, so to speak. Following, it's basically unfortunate, but it's following that that father footsteps. No, absolutely. You know what I mean? It may be genetic. You know what I mean? Because mm. I always just like people always used to joke like oh you got your father's angle or yeah you know we always yeah. heard that before uh -huh. you know what yeah. i mean so not me your father man. right yes yeah. every time i put a certain face i'm mean, your father and in the in a way i kind of it probably messed me up because when people used to tell me it was like a, it was like a mask for me so anytime i would be upset i would just be acting like my father it yeah. was never me it was right. my father that acts like this and i kind of probably fell more into that like that mindset of you know the only image 
I had him off all this, everything people told me about him. Which was like, yo, he was a gangster, he was this, he was that, he was a killer. So I had nothing else to base my life upon mm. um, as far as for, uh, for my creator, which was a gangster. Mm. And I thought that that's who I was supposed to be, yeah. like my dad. You know what I mean? I was supposed to fill up his shoes. His nickname, his uh, AK in the streets was Ev, E-V. So they, everybody would see me in Brooklyn, like, oh, that's Ev, son. But it would be like I was a celebrity kid almost because of the violence and whatever he was doing in Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah and it was like, I don't know, man. And I kind of got a little, a little lost in that uh, mindset. And um, my incarceration, I would say it, uh, it happened because I was in a desperate moment. And I had a, um, I had a bad day, you know what I mean? Um, I was working at the time, I was in college and all of that, but I just needed a little bit more. You know how that is, working check to check, you in school, but those benefits don't pay off for a couple years later, but I need something today. I need something right now. And I, I was in that predicament to where I needed something right now, and um, I put together a little heist with um, two of my crimeys, and you know we went to a franchise place of business, it was hostages, it was all of that craziness. But when I think about that day, man, I, I just, like, I can't believe I was that bold. It's one thing to, you know, snatch a chain. Right? Yeah. I'm in here like, everybody freeze yeah. and don't know. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. how did I get that desperate to where I had a, a blizz moment mm -hmm. from, um, come on. Uh huh? No, blizz. Remember uh, with, with Tupac? Um, oh, oh, yeah, but juice. Juice, but juice. Juice, juice. So remember blizz was in there like, yo, y'all want a yeah. piece of this? Yeah. They like, nah, I'm good, yeah. son. I turned into blizz. I just walked the spot. Everybody stripped. Yeah. And I was like, yo, I was bugging, bro. Uh -huh. Like, what the fuck was I thinking, man? But I was desperate. Um, I already had my son and my, you know, my girl had just got pregnant with my daughter, Egypt. And I already knew the pressure that one kid. And I'm like, damn, she about to throw another one on me. This is about to be crazy, man. And I just snapped. Because I just wanted to have, like, a little foundation to where I didn't have to keep scrambling yeah. with the baby shower and all of that stuff coming up. It was just a lot. But I made that decision. Um, I ended up, uh, I fought the case for over, like, uh, over two and a half years, and I ended up taking a seven, seven year, five post split, right? And um, I did, uh, I did all of that time mostly in a, in a max. I was in a medium probably for about thirty, uh, three months. Yeah. I say three months, and that didn't last long because I had already came up north on a high, a high frequency, right? So you know, mediums are supposed to be laid back, everybody chilling, yeah. but I was like on time and because of what the island right. had put me through yeah. and then now that they got me in this open space with all these familiar yeah. faces yeah. i'm yeah. like go. super hyped now like oh yeah. yeah yeah everything is gold yeah. and they didn't, it didn't take long for them to realize who i was what my background was what my influence was and it was like whoop throw him right over that damn wall he doesn't deserve yeah. this this freedom so with that first that first day actually oh, you know getting that time as you mentioned that that seven and that post so receiving that and then coming up north, like just that first day, man, when you you know you knew that you had this time to do, mm -hmm. how was that mentally for you? What you thought about, like what you know, did how did you envision life at that time? Um, I didn't. It's it's weird because when you get time, like you know you got to do it, but you really don't know how. It's like you just see like this blank, this big gap in your mind yeah. of like things that you got to fill up. Like this is six, seven, 10, 20 years, but I don't know how and, you know. Yeah. So um, I'm not going to lie. That was probably the first time I cried during incarceration because I'm running around, I'm fighting it, and I'm, I'm getting good news and I'm getting bad news, but I always had hope. Like I'm going to spank this. Or I'm, yeah. But once you finally get that final decision, it's like, oh, shit. So all of the gimmicks is gone, all of the, yo, I swear it wasn't me, and I got to stand on it now. And it was like, fuck. Um, and that day came, um, it came in uh, July, right, on like probably the uh, second and a half year of me fighting the case. My mom never missed a court date. And my mom was sitting in the courtroom, and the judge had told me, uh, listen, we ready for trial. I'm dragging this on for over two years, the people ready. Today, last fine wolf for it started at like 15, you know, they were scaring me at first and they kept going down. Final offer that day was eight years. You know what I'm saying? He said, I offer you eight years <clears throat> or we going to trial, right? So he gave, said, I'll give you two minutes to think about it. But he said, if and when you do blow trial, trust me, that number will double. Yeah. 
And who you had, Judge Fish? He I judge Joker because yeah. he, he had no mercy on me. He basically said, if and when you blow trial, and that has to be on record. So yeah. it was almost biased for you to even tell me I was going to blow trial. Like, that's almost yeah. like pre tip. It was crazy, man. So I turn around, my mom's crying. She had one of those things on. Like, she, um, she's a, a church. Uh, she's the minister, but she always keeps like a scarf wrapped right. around her, right? Mm -hmm. And I see her like wiping her eyes with it. And I just looked at her, and she just like nodded her head, and that was like the confirmation, like the fight is over, like don't play with them. Yeah. And that's when like my, my everything dropped, like my heart dropped because it was like, I gotta really do it now. Right. Once mommy hit that green light, it was yeah. no more talking. It was like I, right. and I looked at my lawyer. I was just gave him a thumbs up, and I promise you, um, the day I got sentenced, the, the judge told me because you didn't waste our time, I'ma take a year off. Mm -hmm. One day in prison that you ain't got to do mm -hmm. is a lifetime. For yeah. him to take out a whole bullet was yeah. like, oh, shit. I didn't realize the significance of it until the bid was over, but I'm like, yo, to, to still have that, nothing that's happening right now would be happening for me if I would have kept that extra year. Mm -hmm. Nothing. I would have came home at the wrong time. Everything would just be off. Nothing would have aligned to this. Right. right, so like that that moment was crucial okay. in all of this working. Absolutely, that judge just having that legacy right there and there was like, you know, what, I'm gonna take back one, right. and yeah. But after that, I took the time. I went back into that holding cell. I was in um in the tombs at the time, Manhattan Court. And when they finally closed that gate this time, it was a different mm -hmm. head. Like it sounded yeah. different this uh -huh. time. Like, and I was like, oh shit, it's yeah. real now. Right. And for right. somebody that never been up north, that fear of the unknown is crazy. Like, it literally feels like you're about to be thrown in some habitat of the unknown with lions, tigers, and bears, and you got to fight your way out this jungle, man. And yeah. I, I, that's a scary feeling, bro. We all know that feeling. That's right. All too well, man. I'm sorry. I just literally, like, blanked out. You just gave me a memory of when I first pulled up to Attica, when I first got to Attica. Like, I thought I was a real fucking tough guy. <laughs> And I remember when they were dropping, they were dropping, I, I was just getting out the um, S block. Mm -hmm. They just been doing two years in S block. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking I was going to a medium. Right? And they pull up the Attica. <laughs> and the first thing from all the shows of Attica and the stories from Attica, right? The only thing I remember in the middle of Attica when you pull up to that wall, that's a, you can see that's a, the crack on the wall from that riot mm -hmm. that they try to paste over, like cement over it, but you can see it mm -hmm. where they paste over it. And I looked and I see the CEO comes out and he's like with the little pad mm -hmm. and my name because of my name, first letter and the third letter in the alphabet, he said he called uh, somebody a royal and then it was like Cologne and I was like Cologne who? Mm -hmm. He's like Anthony Cologne. I said what you calling me for? He said, this is gonna be your new home and my fucking and and listen, I knew it was real when that thing gets sunk down. I was like. What? That reality, that fucking fear, like really captivated me. I was like, oh shit, like now, now I'm in the fucking lion den, right? Absolutely. What was the worst thing that you seen while you was in there? Hmm. Well, you know, I did some Tom and Clinton, so mm -hmm. I got some stories, right? Yeah. Um, Gladiator School. Yeah. Yeah. That's what yeah. Yeah, about. Yeah, bro. Thirteen um, years in that spot. Absolutely. I think. Serious. So I was one of those those brothers, man, where I had a lot of influence, had a lot of power in jail. And it wasn't, to be honest, it wasn't even something that, like, I wanted or that I even courted. It was just another thing that I inherited, right. just a how I am, how I think, how I how I operate in the field. Dudes just gravitated to me. And they, people who, who have a team or something that you need to move, you always want to think of. You know you need the missiles and the dudes that's going to be your muscle, but you know, without a doubt, you need somebody to think and strategize for you. Mm -hmm. And... The higher ups in that world seen that fast and was like, nah, let's give son some position. And he's connected, you know, with the, the the drug trades and shit like that. So that always helps the benefit of whatever's going on in there, mm -hmm. right? So they gave me that without even without even thinking twice. Um, so I was one of those dudes that will always try to like blanket the little homies that I could see doing nine thousand miles and you about to crash all into a wall. And it'd be dudes like that, be sitting there just watching them. Like how he is running around, borrowing yeah. shit, all in everybody conversation. I'll be sitting there like, damn, you probably got another commissary bar in you, Joker, and you're going to be walking out this crib like this because you're just doing too mm -hmm. much. But this comes from not having no experience. You coming into a very controlled environment, doing a lot. Mm -hmm. And I used to try to always 
school these dudes, pull them up, put them under my wing, work out with them. Feel what I'm saying? Because a lot of dudes realize like whoever I bought around me, it was kind of like off limits. And they knew this was somebody I was pointing to. Right? So it was this kid I had started doing that with. And he was just running around, you know, stared with his head chopped off. But he loved that deuce, that K2. Yeah. So it's one thing to talk to somebody when they sober, and then it's another thing when they high, and then now it's kind of like you lose them again. Can't get through. Yeah. yeah. And I try to talk to this kid, man, and he didn't really have no no outside support. And so everything he got was on the land, washing clothes, doing little contracts, selling mm -hmm. his food. And um, I guess one of the porters caught him one day. He put like a, a, a hanger on like the um on like one of them little brooms. Yeah. And pulled somebody T V out they sell. Mm. And Clinton. Right? Um and I think I think he did that he was able to do that because he ended up getting like a porter position. So now you on a gallery, you can post it out of people sell while they have programs and all that and you you play yourself. And they, they told on him, right? And I remember they um they was lobbying the whip, like, oh son out there, he violated and just been telling son to stay out the way. And uh like a couple days later, I tried, if I'm saying, but Something like that is crazy. Mm, you pull a dude right. color TV out the cell with a, yeah. you're doing too much. So I kind of threw the top win with it. And I remember they had ran into a cell one day. We had, we was going to chill, but we had like a little bozo dude there. He don't really give a fuck. He blocking the things out and then he just going right back downstairs. Yeah. He just letting it run itself. And that was the perfect opportunity for them. And they ran up in Sun's cell. But it wasn't the fact that, you know, they got with him and all that. It was the fact that like, when I walked by, I seen one of the bigger dudes like knees on his son's arms. And I, I know they eating. You know what I'm saying? So I could see some arm moving, but to see something like he can't even defend himself right, yeah. was crazy. And then when they finally did bring him out, you already know son was like shit hanging all its kind of ways. Right. And one of the worst things to ever experience during the shooting is to make eye contact with the victim. Mm -hmm. That's why when a lot of dudes get shot, dudes just be like this, trying to look away because that person that got shot is looking around and see who knew. Because you're going to know off yeah. of somebody's face, like, yo, bro, like, yeah. we was just talking 10 minutes ago. You just gave me a cigarette. Like, now you sitting there with the face. You knew, bro. Mm -hmm. And we made eye contact. And he knew I was trying to pull into him and I was trying to save him for that. He, he had that look still, like, face hanging, but it was like, bro, I tried, bro. Yeah, yeah, and that yeah. shit hurt me, bro, because I... I've I knew I couldn't position. save everybody, but that one was just like, damn, yeah, little homie. I've like, I've been in that position. And yet to clarify, when we're talking about, you know, getting shot in the, oh, in yeah, the system, yeah. in the Sliced. system is when a person gets stabbed or cut up really bad. Um, you know, yeah, just, just to clarify that. For those that haven't been in there that's listening, you know, shit is real. It's, it's real, you know. And, um, yeah, they held him down, man. They, yeah. they got with him, bro. Man. Well, what point, what point? You know, through all of that, right? Cause we see the good, the bad, the ugly in prison. And like prison, I always say, it's like four. You gotta either be built for tough or you're gonna get swallowed up, yeah. right? But at some point, I always tell a person, you know, listen, we all have a conscious, right? We all have a heart. Who we are to identify or, or to fit in, we put on this mask, mm -hmm. right? We, we put up our defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. To survive, man. At some point, though, that conscience kind of gets to you, where you're just like, yo, I'm just tired of this shit, yo. Like, I, I need something. Got to take something. Something got to change, right? And, and 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 some people call it an epiphany. Yeah. Other people just call it a change of heart. And I just call it just just growth and development, man. Like you know what I mean? Your maturity, That's you know. Right. And the Bible it talks about you know, as a kid we do childish things. As an adult we do adult things, mm -hmm. right? And so at what point? When you sit and going through all that, that you said to yourself, yeah, yeah, bro, like enough is enough, yo. Like and some I had people a, never get it, yeah, right. And, and, and that's the and that's never the shame. even think about enough is enough. You, they they you get know, the thought, but they dynamic. pass it by, right? They don't Absolutely. act out on it because they still and caught up in still getting the approval from the outside negativity. Right, but when you gotta look at you know a mother that raised you, come to court every day for every court you're hearing, and to look at her and give you that thumbs up like your son, go ahead, Eho, go do that. You know what I'm saying? I got you. I'm gonna hold you down. And to see that pain in her face and like to know like yo, you got little ones out there. You have a gift that you really haven't tapped into, right? Because you know you have a gift. Yeah. And he, when was that point when you was like yo? Turning point for you. Right? Yeah. When did that happen? Um. It wasn't even it was it was a buildup. Now believe it or not, it kind of was behind the wall because when I came home, and I think the last piece of it happened in Queensboro, okay. because that's where I was um, introduced to Exodus. 
Absolutely. They came in to Queensboro to do a workshop. So just like how I was going to Rikers Island, pulling up to the unit, oh. they came in there. But mind you, I just been in the mountains for six years. And anybody that I did, did see that looked like me who wasn't wearing green was weird. You know what I mean? That was of color. Like you yeah. was you was for the people, but you not like not in public. Like you'll give me a little co side conversation, but when you with the masses, it's like don't even look at me. You know better. Right. You understand? It's like it wasn't me talking for an hour at the at the gate last night, and then when they in that yard with the mother the mother people, like I said, they don't even look at you. And when they responding to that to that alarm, they are gonna treat you the same way. That's right. Right. So um, uh. I remember right before I had went to Queensboro, because I was like down to like my last year and a half, and I had to keep that mask on. So even though I wanted to change, I knew mm -hmm. I couldn't do it too early because I would get sucked up into that system as well, right? So I had to kind of like, it was the weirdest thing to like be front line, but to try to be the furthest person on that, on that frontier. Oh, wow. Like, yeah. it's crazy because I'm like, we having riots, five, nine buildings with dudes is pulling out shit this big. Mm -hmm. And I got two years to go home. Yeah. In a gunfight with somebody that got 18 in life or somebody that's never going home. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yo, how am I going to get out of this? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start tacking on time and I'm never going to get out of this place, right? Yeah. So once I kind of got my window to that extent of like a year and a half, two years, I started trying to strategize. Like, all right, now this is the part of the game where I got to, because I'm not even telling dudes I'm short. You do, yo, how much time you got rock? Like, yeah, you know, a little something, but ain't nothing crazy. But I'm saying shit like that. Ain't like, no, but I ain't too short for a long conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I say yeah, shit like yeah, that. Yeah, and the life yeah, is just, yeah, yeah. you know no, what's going right. on. So you say that to somebody with life, like, I ain't too short for a long conversation. They respect that. Like, I got some time, bro. I'm here. So it's like, I. Right, but I would never tell you, all right, eight months, you know? So I had called a, um, I had called a charge, which a man, Bobby Schmurder, <laughs> out of all people. Right, your man Chewy, he got me jammed up. And I'm, I'm in Clinton Mess Hall. I'm working on the serving line. And Bobby walks in the mess hall. And, you know, I was I was smoking heavy at the time. So, you know, in prison, you could tell if a person, a joke could take a pull yeah. of something like, nah, you you look like you in another place right now. I want to go there, son. We inside, we inside. Because everybody want that, you know, that escape. Mm -hmm. So I'm on the line, whatever. And he see me. And, you know, I gave him the head nod, like, yo, what up, bro? And when he looked at me, he like, yo, what's up? And then he was like, Gave me that face, like, yo, what's up? Like, you got it? Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna see you tomorrow. He's like, all right. Next day, he comes back on the line. I had the, the 350s, whatever, put together. And I like, I had it in the cup, but I had turned the cup, like, on the tray. I'm like, put it on the thing. I'm like, yo, bro, don't move the cup. And like, try to get juice or nothing. Wait till you get to the table. He's like, all right, bro. So in Clinton or in many facilities, putting your hands in your pocket is a sign of aggression. Mm -hmm. So if you put your hand in your pocket, you might head off the rip. Yo, what you doing? Yeah. And you got to show them what you're going to grab, right? Yeah. And I told him, I'm like, yo, bro, don't grab it. He's like, all right. He tries to throw it in his pocket and be slick. Bobby Schmurda. They got binoculars on him at all times. Like, right. They had yeah. pictures of the brother in the ticket office, and they was throwing darts at it. So his face had, like, little holes in it. Wow. I swear to God, yeah. ask him about shout, it, right? Shout, shout out to Bobby Schmurda. Shout out to Bobby, yeah. man. Yeah. Absolutely. We fought that ticket for, like, two, three weeks, and we sat down in that office every day, and we just built. And I got to know him on a personal level. And, um... But uh, so he so he tries to put it in his pocket. The officer notices, and he's like, "Hey!" So once he says, "Hey," Bobby turns around and tries to do like, "Yo, talking about? I ain't doing that." Yeah. Just fell like right there, bro. Like the whole <laughs> mess hall was quiet. Like you can hear it go. Boop, boop, boop. I'm like, "Damn, bro!" So they blitz me there because they see the whole transaction. Right, right. So they blitz me. They handcuff me. They send me and him to the shoe. And we just talking on the gate all night. Like, yeah. at first, I was wild him up. Like, yo, bro, goofy as hell. Like, you fucked my situation yeah, yeah, up. Because yeah, yeah, now yeah. I got the red light on me. Like, yeah. they're they going to take my yeah. business. My mess hall job is done. My yeah. operation is ruined. But it was a week before Father's Day. Right. Mm. Which is crazy because, come on, bro. I want to eat a good meal. I want to uh, watch a movie. Day. I want to talk to my right. kids, get my visit. Right. So a week before Father's Day. And, of course, my kids came and seen me. But it was just a different visit being in that, in that mm. setting coming out, not really eating right, so my energy is low, I'm, I'm not getting movement, so I look, you know the, you know how that starts yeah, to take an effect absolutely. on you, and I didn't want them seeing me like that, I never like to get visits in or just coming out the box, mm -hmm. I always like them to see me healthy, like, let me get my shit together, because yeah. it takes a toll on you, yeah. Yeah. anybody that does um, solitary confinement, That's I swear, right. it takes like two, three months to really get yourself back, right. and your mm -hmm. diet in order, the, the, the pigment of your, your get, skin. Get, get your skin color back. Oh, bro, that shit, they lock you in a dark room and just leave you there for months. Like, that's not normal, right? So, um, right, so my kids came and see me, and um, 
and they just cry, you know what I mean? Like just seeing me like that all shackled up again and my son, like he didn't know what was going on, you know? And the last time it seemed like that, I was going to jail, you understand? Like from home, like they right. came and blitzed the crib. That's the last time they seen me in cuffs. Every other time I walked out like regular. Um, but I think that was just the point, bro. Like to sit there with Absolutely. my kids on Father's Day. I'm supposed to be this provider. I'm supposed to be this great man for you. I'm saying on Father's Day, shackled at this table. Mm -hmm. um, and it just it just broke my heart to, 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 to see my family in that condition, right? And I made it my business, not only to beat that ticket, because I was able to beat that, right? Mm -hmm. Don't ask me how, I, I got it yeah. done. But I beat that sure. ticket, because they really couldn't prove it was a hand-in-hand. -hand. It was on a tray, you know how that yeah, go, right? that's right. <laughs> so I beat that ticket, and I got my, um, my ART and all of that shit back, because I was supposed to be starting programs. Right. So that was another thing, like all of the good time was about to be out the window. Right, so once I got the good time back and they dismissed it, my class dropped and I was able to leave Clinton, wow. and I got the Clinton right. That's amazing because that's that's your turning point in in your blessing. Yeah. You understand? You know yeah. what I mean? At the same time, <laughs> and same a lot time. of times we don't identify it. But with God, you know what I mean? He also removed me from population because Absolutely. I'm fighting a the ticket for there like a your mind. blessing. All of the blessings. There go, bro. man. That's why you with us today, and, and you know what I'm saying, and the mindset that you in. That silent call, that that you know, what I mean, either we was talking about the frequencies, right? Yeah. We got it sometimes it, it, all around us, right? The signs, the the, the the voices, like it's always something that's you can speak something into existence. Mm -hmm. But when you're woke and you're conscious of things that you want to bring into fruition, mm -hmm. it's there. The signs are always there. Chef, we're moving too freaking fast. Mm -hmm. And we just be like, oh, oh. Sometimes we just got to slow it down and be like, got you. Yeah. Pull it, so, you know what and, I mean? And so I just wanted, I just wanted us to go to that, that point where when it was release time. Mm -hmm. Yes. That day of release. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? From the prison system, man. And just you knowing that you have to transition into this new journey because... Absolutely. Whether you do four years or 34 years, man, that's a long time. Day. Away from, a, you know what Day I'm saying? To be, to be snatched out of society, mm -hmm. you know, and put into that, that, that lion's den. I think, I think it's a difference, right? Jail is horrendous for anybody, right? But you know it's two kind of bitters. You got the brother that go to child, get his little bread, go back to the cell, and he watch his movie and stay in there until whatever, right? And then you got the dude that's popping out every day like this. What's right. up? And anytime yeah. something's happening, it just fall, literally falls on my plate. Mm -hmm. Dudes that I met three minutes ago do something to somebody and automatically I got problems in this building yeah, now. Yeah, like yeah. big problems. Right. Yo, he shot this dude or he took this from this person. I don't even know him, but we just associated with the same brand and yeah. it's off in my head now. Guilty right? by association. That kind of pressure and anxiety at all times is crazy. Because right. I'm, I'm stepping right and I'm moving right, but just knowing I got to count 40, 50 dudes that I know every day when they come out they sell, whatever they do falls on my plate. Yeah. And it, it jeopardizes my bid. That was crazy to me, mm -hmm. right? Question, so, <clears throat> like, to touch back to on the turning point, the Queensboro thing, right? When Exodus came in there, I met Brother Dawoo. I don't know if y'all, little, little Dawoo, yeah, right? And he's with all these powerful looking brothers with suits on and all of that. And they was kicking some real stuff in there, man. And to find out they was just as impacted blew my mind. Because mm -hmm. first and foremost, I'm like, how these brothers get in here? Like, y'all was in prison and <laughs> yeah, how they yeah, let y'all in the joint? Like, like you, sure you got it on them. I know yeah, one guy yeah, got some yeah, ground. Yeah, yeah, but they, yeah. was, they was serious about it. Like, it wasn't no half-stepping with they shit. Like, you know, and I, didn't, I had all of these great ideas, but I didn't know how I was going to bring them into fruition. I felt like Exodus was going to be, like, some type of vessel for me or a tunnel for me to put all these great ideas and energy and put it through something, right? And they gave me this card. And it was like, yo, this is like a Willy Wonka ticket, man. But in order to get this blessing, you got to bring it back. So in order to bring it back, I got to come to Exodus and get that car back to them, right? So I'm say, I said, no problem. I'll be out of here in like two months. We good. I, I'm going to stand on my word. And believe it, um, believe it, bro. My first day home, I went to Exodus. Yeah. Yeah, what was your emotion? What was those feelings when you was like, yo, oh, yeah, let's I'm take, done. Yeah. I'm like, I'm walking. I'm not like work really. It's not like work not release, right? Where right you got to go out and then you come back, like you're done. You know what I mean? But Yo, you're going home. My shirt home. was dripping. Like, huh? I had to change the shirt that I was left with immediately because I was so wet, like from sweat, man. Yeah, yeah. I was so That's nervous. My hands I remember was that cold too. and wet. Yeah. Like I couldn't sit still. My stomach was, it was crazy, man. And there's no other feeling like that in this world, yeah. man, to get that moment back. 
And what made it even crazier was I was in Queensboro, so I could smell the city. I could hear the sirens. Right. It wasn't like coming home from up north. Right, right, you yeah. still got to wait for that moment because right, you right, know this is not home. So I'm out, but I'm still not home. I got released home. Like, right, it was yeah, crazy. Right. right there in the jungle. And, you know, I had all my boys outside. It was like four or five cars. I got some video on Instagram. Yeah. My mom, my sisters, my aunts, everybody was out there to, um, to embrace me, man. And I just broke down, bro. Like, it was just like fun. Like, that whole yeah, time I was holding dude. something, yeah. and I finally just like let the ball go, bro. Yeah. And I dropped that weight, and it was like, it's, it's over. Yes. I was able to take the mask off. I ain't had yeah. to be the top driller no more. It was like, I was done, bro. Like, yeah. I gave it to them. I'm yeah. done, you know? And no, I felt, I felt <laughs> new, bro. Okay, right. I felt new, we, man. Like, we we definitely all know that feeling. Absolutely. And like, that's, that's just, it, it's amazing when we talk to like men of men, right? Yeah. We're, we're men among men. Sure. To be able to say, you know, that you cried and break down. Oh, yeah, no. I mean, you got some guys that don't laugh. Like, it was all good. I'm not listening. Well, that's if the you transition. Are, yeah, you know what I'm saying? That's like, the transition that, that, that we, we talk a lot here, right? Mm -hmm. with, with, with each other mm -hmm. and with brothers that come in, as, sure. you know, and we all go through that transition. So that's the point, that's that moment when I know that, that you ready for that journey, when you ready for that next journey, cause it's another journey coming. And that's you, that's you wanting to get out of one state of mind into another. Mm -hmm. So that's the growth and development that we go through. Mm -hmm. And it's inevitable. Mm -hmm. Everyone must go through it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I applaud you for that. Thank you know what I mean? No question. That was definitely a confirmation I just finished telling one of the little brothers that I had reached out to me, and he had just came home from the fort building, and he sends me this reel on, on TikTok, but he got a gun in it. Right. He got a ski mask on, but but he telling me like, yo, bro, I'm ready to get to it, and I'm home now, and I'm looking at the reel, like, you just, you been home for two weeks, you send me a reel holding a loaded gun. Yeah. How are you, how are you serious right now? How and how are you ready, right? But I sent him a heartfelt message. I didn't like just like it and be like, oh, this fuck. Yo, bro, you bugging right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I have like a, a special connection with God. Like he just sends me visions and, and, and messages, bro. Like I get these these weird things, right? And I felt something when I seen his video. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know what's coming your way, bro, but it's danger. You understand? You need to protect your energy. I don't know who you got problems with, but yo, bro, fall back. You understand? Because mm -hmm. it don't look good. He texted me a couple days ago. Yo, bro, I got locked up last night, but he ain't had that, that gun with him, right? Mm -hmm. right. But it could have easily been on him, right? And, I, and he said, yo, I'm not gonna lie, bro, I'm tired of this shit. Young kid from Coney Island, living in Coney Island Projects. Yeah. You know, that's a hot spot, yeah. right? And I told him, I said, now you ready. Until you tired Sorry. of it. Mm -hmm. Say it. And like, yeah, you right. say it, like, I'm tired of this shit, or you cry, that's when you know you ready. Like, it has to be that weariness, like, sick and tired, sick and tired of being sick and tired, yeah, bro. <laughs> like, being a leader of the, of, the, of the underworld is cool, bro, but it has superficial benefits. Being a leader of the free world, it come yeah. with a salary, it come with a house, come with a car, it come with peace, it come yes. with respect. Yes, let's talk about like, that. Let's, like position, let's, man. let's talk about Leaders that. Leaders of the free world. Right. That's right. We right. rock them now. That now That's right. Right. I ain't get no pension when I was working for the mother jokers. <laughs> yeah. I got a bunch of new charges. I got a bunch of death threats. I got bullets and, and knife wounds to show for it. Absolutely. I want to be a boss over there. Absolutely. Now, now, now we get into the meat and potatoes, right? Because we, we talk about that negative that the world wants to glorify and everything. And just a disclaimer, we don't glorify any of that, man. We, we ask these it. questions so that those that never been that acting a fool out there could understand and see a clear picture mm -hmm. for men and women that been there. Been through it. That man. had to go through it when they were probably advised before, yo, like I've done it for you. Mm -hmm. But we had to right. go and experience it for ourselves. And this is why we get descriptive into those details and those questions. That when a person is listening, they can be like, yo, I, I don't want to go to jail. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have to go through that. Mm -hmm. Because they shouldn't have to. And it's like making good conscious decisions. Mm -hmm. right? It's not always about just being rich with money in the big house, man. You know, freedom is just the, 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 the choice to choose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Choice to choose, man. Like, yo, uh, I, I don't know if I go do that with you. The 99.99% .99 chance I'm going to get in trouble. Mm -hmm. I ain't with that. I'm going to go work hard over here. Mm -hmm. Right? And so when we talk to you and what everything that you had been through, now the rock that I see before me is what 
community leader. Sure. He's giving back to his community. Sure. He's making music. You're living your life. You, you, sure. you, 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 yeah. you, you're following your true North Star. Like, let's talk about what Rock is bringing into the community. Mm. Um, I'm bringing in everything but drugs, I promise you, man. Yeah. Everything but drugs. Yeah. Nah, I promise. <laughs> so I, so I, I, I used to make a joke. Yeah, I'm bringing right. in everything but drugs, bro. That's and right. I used to make a joke when I was to walk through some of these neighborhoods that I, that I got sticks of hope. Yeah. Cause somebody walked up to me one day. It was a K two head. Like, yo, you got sticks. I looked at him and laughed. I said, "Of hope? Are you trying to buy one? I got sticks of hope." He was looking at me like, "What does that mean?" Yeah. It ain't dope. It's the opposite, bro. He, you know, we we laughed at it, but what I bring into the community is mentorship. I bring um, I bring genuine love, right? A lot of these kids don't have somebody that look like me, right? Or you, or you that says, "Yo, did you eat last night? Are you okay?" What's going on at home? And I don't ask you these questions because I want something to happen to your people. So I'm asking because I want to help. I want to see if I got a solution for you, but they know it's genuine. Mm. I'm not talking to you like a teacher that's like, hey, what's going on yeah. in school? At home, and you know you only ask me these questions to hurt my mom or take something away from us. I really want to help you, right? Um, I, bring, I bring accountability. And I tell these, dude, these little bros, man, like, if you don't have spiritual accountability, you, like, you're, you're lost, you're dead, right? And that's why it's easy to be like, oh, I'm a demon, because you don't fear God, right? You have no spiritual accountability, and these kids are not given that. So as you can see, I got on my face, God forgives, right? And I tell them that all the time, no matter how much you did, God will still forgive you. It only takes one day, one moment to repent and bring it all back, and the trajectory of your life will just start to shift. God forgives, bro. Your op may not. The dude, brother that you killed last year, whatever, they might not never forgive you. But God will, right? And I try to I try to stretch that to them. And I just bring that big brother and sometimes even like father energy to some of these kids that really come from a house full of women. That all they hear is clean your room, none of that, brush your teeth, da da da. And then you go to school, pick your pants up, with your homework, that and women just become like this nagging thing that you, you just wanna resist and rebel against. And then when you see men, Yo, what's up, little homie? You all right? And now you looking at what a man looks like. You looking at, so the little kid that be having a little twist, they look at me and see the end version of themselves. Like, is that's what I'm going to look like when I grow up? They see the tattoos that they want already on me. That's what I'm going to look with it on me. Or they just see a reflection of themselves. As your mom, you receive that. At, don't get me wrong, but you could never look at your moms and be like, damn, that's what I'm going to look like when I... Yeah. Can't see yourself in your mom's. You see them little features in her eyes and all that, but seeing your pop, yeah, yeah man. Right. Seeing your pops walk in the crib, and the way he dressed, how he wears hat, everything will start to a little, like, kind of slowly pour into your cup because this is somebody that you're stealing your style from. This is who I should be like, right? And they don't have nobody to stick to, to craft their style behind. So they end up, as we know, following these jokers that's out here just um, with, with, with crumbs for them. Yeah. Not even a loaf. You got a crumb for them, and they mm -hmm. willing to throw their life away for that crumb because they ain't got nothing else. Excellent right? Analogy there. Let me Thank let you. me ask you this real quick, man. And pardon me for cutting you no, off no, in no, your no. spill, because <laughs> you definitely, you know what I mean, into the into transitioning the right way and and productive. And I know you're going you're going far in life with that. It's it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. Your blessings. That's right. Because God forget. You sure. know what I'm saying? He forgives, you know what I mean? So, and um, and however that looks, I say he, but he can be she, <laughs> whatever form of God comes in. Um, I got a question though, man, because, you know, look, listen, I did 27 years, six months, man. Mm -hmm. Just been home two years. I'm, I'm a little, I guess, uh, I guess I got little cobwebs on me when they come to the streets, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because I'm so disassociated from it. Although I keep my ear to it, mm -hmm. I'm a little bit disassociated physically. Mm -hmm. But I do listen to a lot of um, things and I notice like a lot of these young brothers now that's in this hip hop industry, you know, uh, they, it's a lot of talk about snitching, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yep. So I. I just want you to expound a little, if you can, on just your definition of, you know what I mean, yeah. of this, this snitching thing that's oh, going man. on, man, and, and how you look at that in life, man. You All know, because right. it's, it's very important, you know what I mean, I think, because I come from a different era, <laughs> you know what I mean? I come from the 80s, and it's, I think it's redefined. 
No, no, I think it's, it might have been watered down. You know, whatever it is, but I just want to hear your perspective of it. So, snicks in as far as like just straight up telling on dudes. Absolutely. Yeah. So you know, right. we look at this this crew that Anthony be telling me about. So what's that? We got the whole thing with like Gunner mm-hmm. and everything. Oh, you know, yeah, six yeah, nine, yeah. right? And so we we're, we're trying to touch Casanova, on Nova. Right. Yeah. Free cash. Right. So when you start looking at. The game, right? The snitch. When we come up, like I said, we come up from the 70s and 80s, right? Mm-hmm. It was a strong bond. Snitching was considered, yo, if that's that's my ride or die, we doing dirt together. And I get caught and he goes away and we, I get locked up. I don't know him. Don't mention him. Right? I, I got to hold that down. That was a code of honor because mm-hmm. that we did that, right? Because that's just was in your DNA. Right. But nowadays, you got all these dudes that want to talk tough, that want to be gangsters, that want to go pop some smoke and all that, right? Mm-hmm. But yet, they talk about snitching, but they be snitching on themselves, right? Yeah. You just mentioned your homeboy sending you a reel with a, with a ratchet in the hand, right? right That's there. snitching on himself. You got these guys That's now right. on social media, go rob so banks, go blazing, right. and talk put in video, that. but then when it's time for somebody to go to court and say, hey, listen, I got everything that we need on, on the part. He's going away. Right. You can either go away with them for 25 or you can get 10. Mm-hmm. Which one you want to do? Because everything's already there. Yeah, we just want to hear your that, perspective. That, that game perspective on that. Um, so it's, it's crazy, right? Because that that ties into my case. I had two codes. One was gang affiliated and one was like, you could almost say he was my blood brother. Like when I moved to Ghost Town when I was five, like we linked up. Like started elementary school together, like his mom and my mom were like best friends, two adjoining buildings, like right next to each other. You know that vibe. Okay. So we outside playing, they sitting on the stoop, drinking or whatever, smoking, having a girl talk. You know how that goes. And this is the person that I did my crime with 20 years later. His mom passed away when he was a teenager, had a heart attack in Madison Square Garden. She worked there, it was a bomb threat. She panicked. My mom's adopted this dude, right? We shared a bed till she bought us a bunk. Right? And I'm giving you all this backstory so you can see the history Absolutely. of how much brotherhood we had. Like, my mom took you in when you lost yours. Like, you my brother, bro. And this was the person that was like... So that fucked me up. Mm-hmm. Because I'm walking into this situation with my eyes closed. Like, I know I'm good. <laughs> y'all got... Who? Who y'all, who y'all found? Oh, I know I'm good. And my lawyer was like, no, you're not. It, it did, and it makes sense to me. I'm like, you, this is one of those moments where you working for the DA, you trying to get my man to look like this, and, and no, it really was that. But the difference between that situation is we all played a part. I got the gun, you driving, you in front of the store with something on you, but you would look out. All of those good things. Like, it's three of us, all three of us played a part. And you was well... Um, you was well informed of what your role was. It's not like, yo, right now, we going to drive into the store, I got something on me, but I don't tell y'all. And then when they pull us over, I'm like, yo, we got to hold this down. We gangsters, right? Don't Nobody don't say nothing. No, nigga, that's your gun, and you need to step up, bro. I got a family. I got responsibilities. You don't, you can't do that, right. right? But a situation like mine, we all did that. So he told on me. He was dead wrong for that. Me and my kid's mom fell out. She came to see me in Rikers Island. I'm in a box at the time, right before, like, that trial part that we spoke about of with me taking the time. And she was so excited. She like, oh, the lawyer has this great news. And this is how I knew. Like, I always thought I knew my baby, mo- my kid's mother, but I, I didn't realize she was, like, that green. And she was like, oh, I got this great news. Like, they, they talking about, like, dismissing it and letting you go over. But I'm like, how? Like, how would that work? She's like, oh, you just got to cooperate. And so I'm sitting there. And it was almost like, I know she just, all these years you've been around me, like, you, you would respect me as a man and still kind of, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's no way. And she's sitting there with my son. He's like two, three. He don't know what's going on. But I asked her. I'm like, yo, that's how you want to raise my son? That he could go out in, into the streets and just do, do some malicious shit with somebody. And if he has the opportunity to push him in the fire to do it, he got to stand on that. You understand what I'm saying? I know what I did. And I'm not going to cooperate against anybody to get less time, more time, nothing. Right? I'm going to stand on what I did. Right. And that's what I did. And she didn't respect that. And I, that's kind of the point where she almost left me. Because she even said some weird shit like, oh, you want to be in here. Uh-huh. And that hurt me, bro. Right. So all this shit that I was going through in there, it was like, you think I want to be in here? But because I stand, like, it, there's no honor amongst these, but we do have a contract. Right. Mm-hmm. We do have a contract. And that's why dudes is able to stand you, to hold you up against shit, because it is an unwritten contract that you sign, right? 
but it's no honor because dudes will blow the, blow the back of your motherfucking head off right after splitting half the bag with you, mm -hmm. right? And I looked at her like she was crazy, and that was the part where she kind of left me. was like, you know what? You about to be here for time. I tried staying here, right? She ended up having a kid, all of that on me. So it was crazy because I stood by the creed. So now the, um, the gunner situations and all of that, like I feel like they wrong for that. If you know what that was and you got into this shit with bro and this is what you was able to amass from it, bro, make sure your people's just set out right and you just you gotta go handle your business. But you can't you can't throw that man in the fire so you can get back into this line. Like, that's not right to me. You understand? Right. I don't I don't condone anybody telling on somebody, right, that had something to do with the crime. Right. Now if you tell on somebody like I seen somebody get shot last night and you come in as a witness, mm. I'm a peace broker. Right. right, I'm in the community trying to stop violence, mm -hmm. so I can't be a hypocrite and say I stand against that because that person that you witnessed kill an innocent bystander, whether you thought that man was wrong or not, has the potential to do it again and again and again, mm -hmm. and that person could eventually become my daughter, my son, my mom's, Absolutely. my close friends, and it will only affect me when it's them. Now I want justice. Now I want. Yeah. But if it's somebody else, like nah, hold that down. But if it was my mom that got shot, had come home from work, I would want justice, bro. And I'm not. I don't wish jail on nobody. But that man don't deserve to just be walking around here with my mom's as a vegetable or in the coffin. And I, I need justice. You hit it. So you hit it, you hit it right on the head. And I don't think there was no better answer. Like absolutely, it's just. Absolutely. You know what I mean, like we we. I, this is what I tell. I tell my son. I tell everybody. Listen. You can't be a gangster and a preacher at the same time. Oh, I, you, you can't, you know, I, I tell people all the time, like either, either you want to be a gangster or you want to be a peacemaker. Mm -hmm. You can't be both, bro. You can't play both sides of the fence. Pick one, stay true to it, and that's it. And there's a word right. for that, hypocritical. Right. You and, know, you know what I'm saying? We call as, hypocrites. You know what I mean? Someone that that think that they can be halfway in and halfway out and think that it's going to forever work for you, that you're going to, you know, go up in, in glory with that. So you're going to come down sooner or later. And, 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 that, and that's what it boils down to. Like, when we make this transition to live this life, right, to be yeah. taxpaying citizens, mm -hmm. to work hard, to provide for your family, to, 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 to be recognized in your community as a positive subject. You have to separate yourself to either I did the life that I want to live now because I want to stand by my community or do I want to continue to show a blind eye to my community, mm -hmm. right? You can't, you can't do both, Absolutely. right? And what's right is right, what's wrong is wrong. We'll leave that at that, mm -hmm. right? Um, yes, could we run about run out of time? We can talk all day, my brother. Mm -hmm. um, I do, I do like that. As far as not serving two masters, and mm -hmm. once I realized that I couldn't do it no more, okay. because it's one thing, right, to put on the mask and like, yo, we out here. When I say I really put it in, I really put it in. Like I didn't fool nobody to get to the top. Like I really did it, but I had to become a different person to do it. Yeah. So you know what it's like, man, to go in there. Like, yeah, I made my mistakes, but this environment is unnatural. Right, and you got to do unnatural things to survive there, right? So you become a person that you know you're not. I wasn't running around trying to rip the skin off of people's faces in New York. I wasn't running around sticking, you know, uh, plexiglass, you know. I wasn't giving it up like that in New York, bro. So the fact that I'm doing these things now, and they used to be over animalistic things. Like, yo, they not giving us cereal. Rikers Island shit. The motherfucking good cereal come. They take all of it, and that was just yeah. weird shit like that. Yo, we out of here. And I used to be like... Damn, wow. like once I really thought about the shit that I really jumped out the window for and hurt people for, a, a box of cereal this big with probably nine Wheaties in it. Mm -hmm. yeah. This dude's walking around disfigured mm -hmm. because they was trying to hold on to them frosted yeah. Wheaties oh, or flakes. You know, the yeah. frosted Wheaties yeah. and flakes. Anything yeah. with yeah. sugar yeah. on it because yeah. sugar is a drug in prison. Yeah, it is. Sugar yeah. releases that endorphin in your body when you go in your yeah. cell and you eating that Facts. candy. It makes you feel good. Yeah. And anything that makes you feel good in there, bro, is a drug. And we want it. And we want anything. more of it. You're right. More of it, right? <laughs> You're right. Anything That's that right. makes you feel good in prison becomes a drug. And you just do overeat. You overindulge That's with the right. magazines because it makes you feel good. You want to just mm -hmm. keep that pain from... Beside him, right? So absolutely, turn it to an end. So real quick, mm. let me hit on this, right? So as we were talking in the beginning, when we started talking, I started writing a couple words down, mm -hmm. and it's funny because now you just hit on those words that I that I that, that that I wrote down without you even knowing, at, and like what I'm what I heard is accountability mm -hmm. as men and women as adults as good 
decision makers, we have to have accountability and responsibility, own up to our shit, mm -hmm. move forward. And you also mentioned hope. Got to have that hope, right? Got to have that hope. The minute we lose hope, is all, 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 all bets is gone, right? And then we talked about what we don't really discuss or address is the mental health disorder that we acquire, mm -hmm. right? I'm in the mental health field, right? And I tell people all the time, you got two type of mental health disorder, those that are born with it and those that acquired it. Mm -hmm. And I believe that men and women who have sustained what we have went through to get to where we at now suffer through some type of mental health. Yes, I was so talking good. about this, right? Like mm -hmm. me to this day, spent 22 years in and out of prison. I can't hear the sound of metal clanking. Mm. It, 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 it literally like crawls out of my skin, right? right? And I, I just wanted to touch on that because there's something I want to start touching more on. Yeah. And But what you're doing to the community, because I know we got like 10 minutes yeah, so left. I got two things. Go so my thing, just to be yeah, back, my thing is light. I became Cyclops when I came out of prison. Like right now, I'm doing this for you, but th I got a migraine right now, bro. Right. Sorry. For wrestling light, highlight, I wear all black because I, black <laughs> yeah. is powerful. Right. But like that's how my life is. But in I bring even though like I have a dark demeanor, I'm all about the light. Mm -hmm. It's weird, but light right. is something that that's one of the things that I took from prison. That like it. It freaks me out. I, I go into a room with all of them lights and it just like gives me anxiety. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. I can't, mm -hmm. it's just too many things. You so know what I mean? Yeah, no question. People don't understand the transitional those little, shades that kind of bring it down. Triggers yeah. That you have to be conscious and mindful of God, Eric. So, two things I just want to, you know, touch on before we roll out. Um, I want you just, uh, what would you, you know, the advice you would give to people coming home from prison? You know what I mean? As well as people out here now that, you know, may be in that. <laughs> In that space that we used to be in, that you know, in that space that where we had to grow, grow out of and develop out of, and and also, you know, with with that also touch on what what Rock's doing now, like you know what I mean? What yeah. you doing now tomorrow? You know what you got going? You know what I mean? I'm I'm probably late for a, a, an event right now. Y'all know the schedule yeah, is crazy. Yeah. So share that with the advice and, and nah, absolutely. So. One of the main things I would tell one of my brothers coming home is to just try to stay out of too many pots, right? Don't do a whole bunch of everything. Do a whole bunch of one thing, right? So if you nice with fixing cars, just fix cars, bro. Don't fix cars, scam, sell weed, da da, da. Just try to fix cars in every, in every day, right? Because this is all I wanted to do. I got paid to do something that I love, which is do music, help kids, and fix my community. Yeah. And I got a salary for that? I've been doing it for free my whole life, right? Yeah, right? So it's like, just find something that you really, really like, bro. And if you manifest it every day and every conversation, every interaction is based on that, that passion is gonna manifest itself. Right. If you're a podcast and all you do is talk to podcast, talk to, and everything is like, it, it, it involves this world, it manifest for you, right? right? But if you put your blessings in so many pots, you're not gonna get nothing back. So just stay focused on just one thing and just try to execute. Facts. Execute. <laughs> and they, even if you don't want to stay on it, just execute and then figure something else out. Good. Um, and um, the next point, right? Uh, you said. What are you That's doing what you now? Mean. Tell oh, them what, what you're doing, doing, how they can reach you, you. you. How can they connect with you? Today, Roll out the back. center every day. Yeah. So <laughs> my day starts as, uh, as a peace broker for Exodus, right? I'm coming here and I'm canvassing the neighborhood from 5 o'clock at night to about 1 in the morning. Mm -hmm. I'm going to the hot spots in the South Bronx, East Harlem, um, that I know dudes is overdosing, dudes, kids is getting shot, and I make my presence felt. I'm there. I'm putting up flyers with my real name on it. Dudes know who I am in these areas. And that's why I'm going to them. I was blessed by my agency to allow me to have catchment areas where people actually know me. Mm -hmm. Something that was kind of working against me in Rikers Island because they was like, oh, he has unfamiliar, uh, undue familiarity. He knows too many people here. Yeah. How? <laughs> these are all brothers from my community. How wouldn't I know them? Did you, did you extradite these brothers from Arkansas or something? Yeah. Yeah. Because that's something I said. You're from Brooklyn, Bronx, and Queens. Where you think I lived all my life, right? So I had... um. So I come, I do the Peace Broker thing for Exodus. Um, I'm a youth mentor by heart. So Absolutely. I have a basketball team. I'm the new head coach for Saturday Night Lights. Oh, yeah. I'm actually in uniform 
I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm a little late for a clinic. I got to do a basketball clinic in the uh, in the South Bronx tonight. So you, so you guys are lucky yeah. that real, man. He, he, he extended his time with yeah. us because he is running late. Absolutely. But like the positivity in this, brother, like, it's amazing. Tell them Thank about you, your man. music. How can they get in yeah. touch with you? Plug in your music, your, your social media, Absolutely. and all that, and how they can get in touch with you and what's going on. So, y'all could, uh, whoever's tuned in, y'all could find me on Instagram at underscore rockrilla. Um, on YouTube, you could just search that same handle, uh, R O C R I L L A, rockrilla. Um, I have a dope, amazing record called Bigger Than That with uh, Prada Dot, who's a Bronx native and a big advocate for, um, for gun violence and the youth out here. I also have a dope project with Dub Aura called Better Way. Um, it's official, man. I got the shooter in RSA. It's a public school over here. I didn't have a permit. I hope this don't mess my relationship up with them. But they was like, yo, you do so much great work for these kids. You got an hour. So come on, hurry up. You know, it was during the summer. It was no kids in there. But we was able to get the shots we needed. And that, it turned out to be an amazing project. So um, Better Way featuring uh, Dub Aura is on YouTube now. Um, I actually have a dope record with some with some real OGs called The Cypher. And we had this thing where we wanted to get like official dude from every borough and create like a cypher, right? Mm. And you see everybody in their hood. You know, I was in the Bronx. You, know, you had one of the brothers in Flatbush, another brother that was in a Far Rockaway, but all our videos was done. It was done amazingly, but it was called The Cypher. These are three projects I could check out. Um, as far as upcoming projects, I got some dope content with uh, a Miss Silver Rain. Who's a fellow ghost town baby and um, uh, big up yeah. to Silver? Yeah, big up Silver, right? she from High Bridge, but we stole her and all like. that. Y'all got eight buggy, y'all good, son. But um, yeah, um, so yeah. Besides that, like I said, I got um some dope records out right now on YouTube. This one right here. Uh, this is better way. Uh, 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 ain't no better for copyright purposes, so they don't take this down. I know. Huh? Right. Who owns the copyrights? Rock Rilla and Exodus Productions, baby. Do we have your permission to go ahead and rock this out? 100%. Absolutely. Don't touch our shit, people. <laughs> okay? Yeah. yeah. Seems like yesterday, heavy on it, but we started with some featherweight. Uh, trying to find light. For heaven's sake, labeled us a menace. Just trying to find a better way. Huh? Seems like yesterday, heavy on it, but we started with some featherweight. Uh, Trying to find light for every sake, labeled us a menace. Just trying to find a better way. Ah. Took a wrong turn through the devil lid, untouched, made it home, nigga. Not a devil scared. So many demons in the spot, they think the devil here. So many demons in the spot, they think the uh, word of the game. This is family music. Forgive me for them days when I put the family through it. Three ghosts in the back, so the phantom is moving. LV for the blues, and we bout to run through them like. Dirt A, huh? That's what your chicks call me. Used to be broke blood, nigga. Now I'm rich, homie. Moving like you drunk, sort of fifth on me. It's just me and my switch, the switch on me. Um, yeah. Ghost sound, baby, nigga, big frosty. Remember nights, they just try and get a nick off me. Now I'm cool side, try and get some nicks off me. Trap nightmares, still try and watch the break off me. Right, seems like yesterday. How we on it, but we started with some featherweight. Um, Trying to find light for heaven's sake, leave with us a minute. Just trying to find a better way. Seems like yesterday, I'm a man. The only one started was here. Trying to find light for heaven's sake, leave with us a minute. Just trying to find a better way. Trapped in this maze, I was trying to find a better way. Heavy on it, but we started with some featherweight. Where I'm from, I see some things I could never say. I was like Ray Charles every day. Huh? I was trying to get a set away. Right. It was trying to put my set away. Team Orange died and we was enlightened. Fill the bottle with lightning now. Yo, hey. <laughs> Can't take no weekends off. So many broke nights for dinner. I had to sleep it off. Ooh. So Ooh. Being poor, now I'm so comfy at the top. I got my sneakers off. Uh, Aura, that's what the chickens call me. I was slime like Michael, but they were spinning on me. I took that page out that book. That was a different story. It's for my dogs in the pen. They depending on me. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <Woo>. Okay. <laughs> Fire. Fire. Yo. Listen, that's a stand up performance. Right there, yo. Watch that. Give it up, yo. Keep the rolling, whatever. Right. Keep it rolling, whatever, yo. That was fire right there. Yeah. Now I said, Toya, we bringing it heat 
for Hot 2023. Yeah, Absolutely, man. Man. This is dope, man. man. Come on, man. Come on. Me, bro. 